So there's some extra bags in that wagon over there. I know some of you are probably thinking that you would probably like to have one. I don't know what Marcy's policy is on the extras, but you can see her after the service if you, if you think you need one. I'm sure Laura will get one, right? Yeah. Oh, she, <laughs> there's her policy right there. <laughs> Message received, Marcy. <laughs> <clears throat> when Dave was praying a moment ago, he, he mentioned at the end of his prayer, um, uh, he, he asked that, that uh, the Lord would be close to Joanne Boyce. I don't, I don't know if everyone in here knows Miss Joanne. We, we have a lot of folks who are, are new to us in recent months, uh, and you may even be new, new to us today, so you have no idea who Joanne is. Joanne is actually Marcy's mother, and she's a dear, dear woman of God who, if you, if you know anything about her, have ever been around her, you know she loves the Lord with all of her heart, and uh, you spend a few minutes with Joanne, and you come away feeling closer to Jesus as a result. It's beautiful. Courtney's grandmother, I see Courtney, Courtney, our, our summer intern, Marcy's daughter, Joanne's granddaughter. So th- there's some family connections for you if you didn't know that already. And, um, you know, every time I'm with Joanne, um, I, learn something, I learn something new, or something I have already known is reinforced uh, to my heart. And, and as she goes through these final stages in her life, uh, she's, she's, at, she's at home, uh, she's rece- receiving hospice care. Um, and as she goes through these final stages in life, um, I'm learning as I spend time with her that, that there's, there's certain truths that God is reinforcing to me through her. Things that, again, I, that I know, or even some things I haven't even learned yet, but through, through Joanne, I'm coming to know them more and more. It's, it's interesting that the thinner that veil gets between this, this life and the next, in a lot of ways, the more clear our perspective becomes on things. I've been captivated for weeks by this, this statement she said. I think I shared it with you a few weeks ago, and I, I'm going to keep sharing it because it's something we, need, we all need to hear over and over again. And it's this idea that, uh, in her words, leave nothing unsaid. Leave nothing unsaid. You know, that's really something that we should, live, we should live by that every day, shouldn't we? I mean, why is it we wait until someone is, is, is lying on their deathbed to finally say what, need, what needs to be said from our hearts to theirs? So there's wisdom in this for all of us. If there's something that you need to say, don't wait. Say what needs to be said. Say what is important. But that's especially true when we're face-to-face with our mortality. When we know that our time in this world is drawing to a, to a close, we're getting ready to step from this side of, of eternity into that, into the next side. It becomes that much more important to say what needs to be said, especially to those who are closest to you. Well, this morning, you may have already seen in your bulletins, we're going to be in John chapter 14. So if you want to go and turn there, please turn there now. And really, this is the context of these chapters of John. John starting in about chapter 13, running through about chapter 17, bleeding over into the next chapter or so. This is is the final words that Jesus has to say to those who are closest to him. As Jesus, who was fully aware of what what lay ahead in his life, he knew that he he had reached the moment of of the cross. And so in light of the cross, in light of this final moment of his earthly life, Jesus chose to say these things. He left nothing unsaid. He says that which is most important to him and what should therefore be most important to us. And I'm convinced, as we've been working through this series over the last four, five, six weeks now on holiness, I'm convinced that we will never understand holiness and we will definitely never experience holiness in this life unless we at some level engage with these verses from John chapter 13 through 17. This is where holiness becomes real for you and for me in every sense of the word. We'll never understand what it means and never experience apart from the truth that Jesus reveals here in these verses. I'm going to be in chapter 14, right in the middle of this upper room discourse. And chapter 14 is really interesting to me because if you divide it right in half, the first half is Jesus telling his disciples, this is the way to the Father. You want to go to the Father? This is how you go to the Father. And then the second half of the chapter is the Father's way to us. How to go to the Father, how the Father wants to come to us. Let's look here. I'm going to read verses 15 through 
through 21. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Now, we're going to take a couple minutes here this morning. I actually brought my laser pointer because we're going to use the screen behind me. I'm going to ask Justin to go ahead and put that, that graphic up on the screen. I don't know how that, oh my goodness, that's not, you can't read that at all now, can you? Okay, so that's my fault. I created this graphic a few years ago, and um, it was for our Wednesday night Bible study class. I wanted to basically, I wanted to go through the book of John. What I did is I sat down with my Bible, I went through the book of John, and I was looking for anywhere where Jesus or, or John or anybody says anything about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, and how they relate to one another. And so every time I found a verse, I, I wrote it down, and then I took those verses and I, and I organized them into different categories. And what you have here that you can't read, but I'm going to explain it to you, so fret not. And if you want a copy of this, I'll be happy to, to provide you one, okay? But what you have here, you have up here is the Father, over here is the Son, and here's the Holy Spirit. And each one of these persons has an arrow, actually two arrows, one pointing here from the Father, one pointing here from the Father to the Spirit. Then the Son has one pointing from the Son to the Father, and one from the Son to the Spirit, and one from the Spirit to the Father, and the Spirit to the Son. And next to each, each line is a verse from John that explains that person's relationship to the other. Okay, so even though you can't read <laughs> any of the teeny text up on the screen, I hope you get a sense of what this graphic is supposed to be. Okay? So when, when I was going through this process, and as I was preparing this graphic for the Wednesday night Bible study a few years ago, there were two main points that emerged from, from this effort that I want to try to communicate to you this morning. So it's going to feel a little bit like class, a little bit like class. I hope you'll forgive the teacher and me can't resist to teach sometimes. So I want to kind of go through this and just teach a few things for a few minutes. There's two main points that I believe emerge from this type of study of the Trinity in the Gospel of John, and the first is this. Each of those three persons, while distinct from the other, is in the other. Okay, now if I lost you there, come back, <laughs> come back. Here's what I'm saying. If we were to look at those verses, you would see things that sound kind of like this. The Son is begotten from the Father. The Son is begotten by the Holy Spirit. These, this is not me. This is, these are Bible verses, okay? These are, this is truth revealed through the Gospel of John. The Son is begotten from the Father. The Son is in the bosom of the Father, in His heart. The Son is one with the Father. The Son lives because of the Father. The life that's in the Son is not His own. It comes from another. The Father begets the Son. The Father is in the Son. The Father is one with the Son. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, He proceeds from the Father, through the Son. He's breathed by the Son. He descends and remains upon the Son. So these are, these are all different verses from the Gospel of John that help us get a clearer picture of who these persons in the Trinity are and how they all relate to one another. And as the early church took these, these verses, this is seemingly mysterious, confusing revelation, and they began to try to sort through it all and, and, and figure out what does all this mean? What is this saying about God? What is this saying about us? They arrived in, around in the fourth century with a word. A word. All right, and I'm going to have Justin now switch to that slide. Hopefully you can see this slide better. Okay, I hopefully, hopefully, oh, that one looks much better. You can actually read that. 
That is a Greek word, and the word is pronounced perichoresis. Per- Raise your hand if you've ever heard that word before. It's okay if there's just a few of you. It's okay. Now, everyone, next time someone says, have you ever heard the word perichoresis? There's 240 people can all raise their hands and say, I've heard that word. You know that you're going to be masters of this Greek word by the time you're done. This is a Greek word. The Latin word that is a synonym to it is circumcision. What, is, what does that mean? It basically means, translated, basically moving around. Rot- rotation. This is the, the idea behind these words. The, this is, these are words that were given to us by the early church to help us explain and understand these verses that we just looked at from the Gospel of John. How the persons of the Trinity relate to one another. Perichoresis. There's a, a mutuality among the persons of God as they are, share life in and through one another. Each one finds their life in the other, from the other. Yes, each is distinct from the other, but they share the life of the other too. There's a, a mutual intersecting. There's a mutual co-indwelling, not a cohabitation. Listen, if you hear co-indwelling and you're thinking of like three's company, don't think that. You remember three's company, right? You got the three people who have this weird relationship to one another. They all just kind of co-inhabit under one roof. It's pretty scandalous back in the 70s and 80s, right? Today, it's, we don't even bat an eye at it. But back then, this was a big deal. A man living with two women under the same roof? That's, that's not right. It was a funny show, by the way. It was a very funny show. But that's not the point. The point is, the three persons of the Trinity are not just three persons who just kind of sh- occupy the same space. They, they, they have, there's the, this home that the three persons all just kind of co- cohabitate. No. What perichoresis says, what God's revelation through his word says, is that these three persons, their home is in the other. That's their home. The Son finds life in the Father, in the Spirit. The Father's life is in the Son, in the Spirit. The Spirit finds, they share life. Their lives are in one another forever. From eternity past to eternity come, this is who God is. Distinct persons who share the life of the other two. It's beautiful. This beautiful expression of of intimacy and, and mutuality and reciprocity that is unique to the Godhead. Three persons one God. That is Christian monotheism. We believe in one God. This is that God. One God in three persons. It's unique in all the world. There's no other theological system. There's no other religious system in the world that's, that's monotheistic that understands God like this. This is something that has been revealed from God to us. It's not something we came up on our own. These aren't, these aren't ideas that some, some person just produced on their own to explain God. No. These are, this is the revelation of God about himself. Jesus steps into human history and he says, I am God, but I'm not the Father. <laughs> so how do we make sense of that? There's, wait a minute, there's now two persons. And oh, by the way, we're sending you another advocate. There's a third person. Jesus refers to him in a personal pronoun. Another person is coming to you. I will send him to I am not him, but I'm coming to you in him. And so we have this incredible, mysterious reality about God that blows out of the water any conception of him that comes before it or has ever come since. God is not some static thing. God is a, a mutuality of persons who share dynamically life and love, who interpenetrate each other. That's God. And that's his revelation about himself to us. God is not just one person who, who jumps behind a curtain and puts on one mask and comes out and says, I'm the Father, and then he jumps behind the curtain again, switches to the other mask, and jumps out and says, I'm the Son, and you get the point. And I know how much you all enjoyed seeing me dance a little jig up here on the platform this morning. God is not dancing a jig. He's not one person who's just swapping masks. He's not one person who just shows up in three different forms. How many times have you tried to explain the Trinity to someone using water? Right? Just like water is water, but it comes in, you know, it's, it's vapor, it's liquid, you know, and it's, it's ice. And we, we think this somehow explains God. Well, in a sort of way it does, but in a sort of way it doesn't. He's not just one person that shows up in three forms. He's three persons. And, and the persons aren't different parts of God. How many of you have used the three-leaf clover to explain God? It's one clover, but it's three parts. No, that's not good enough either. It's not like you have one-third of God is the Holy Spirit and one-third of God is Jesus and one-third of God is the Father. No. There are three distinct persons, but each of them is fully God. Now, I know this sounds kind of like, where is Pastor Sean going today? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make sense 
of these verses that Jesus thought were the most important things to share at the end of his life. This is who I am, Jesus is saying. This is who we are. This is who God is. One God, three persons. Not three gods. That's not what he's teaching. He's not saying there's, there's, this is one God and, and then over here is another God and we just sort of get along with each other. That's, that's tritheism. That's polytheism. That's many gods. That's more. No, the Christian faith is the monotheistic faith of the Jews. Deuteronomy 6.4, Behold, God is one. God is, he is, Yahweh is God alone. There is no other God. And you will say, who's Yahweh? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, no other gods, but that one God in his inner nature is three persons. A unity of persons. Each, each of whom find their life in the other two. Okay, so that's the first main point from the graphic. Justin, switch back to that graphic, the one that no one can read anything from. <laughs> that's the first thing. If you were to sit down and go through these verses in front of you, you can actually read them, that would, I think, would be the, the first thing that sticks out to you, is that each of these persons find their life in the other two. Well, guess what else you will find? Point number two. Not only is each person in the other, but each person is for the other. Some of these verses go like this. The Father loves the Son. So the Father, where, where, is, the, where is all the attention of His heart? It's not on Himself. It's on the Son. The Father loves the Son. The Father shows all things to the Son, gives all things to the Son, shares all things with the Son. He withholds nothing. He gives all of Himself to the Son. The Father, listen to this one, the Father glorifies the Son. It's as if God the Father is saying, don't look at me, look at him. He has, the, he has captivated my heart. I want him to captivate yours. The Father says, look, look at him. And then the Son comes and he says, I follow his example. I follow the example of the Father. I do the will of the Father. I speak the words of the Father. I honor the Father. I obey him. I'm not here doing my own thing. I'm here doing his thing. And guess what? My heart is for his glory. The father want, or the son wants the father to be glorified. The son says, don't look at me, look to him. And the only time Jesus ever prayed that God would glorify him was for what purpose? That he may glorify the father. As Jesus is getting ready to be raised up onto a cross, the moment of his glory, Jesus says, God, glorify me in this moment, in your presence, so that all attention in the world will be pointed to you. What about the Spirit? Well, in whose name is the Spirit sent? It's not in his own name. He's sent in the Son's name. What words does the Spirit speak? According to these verses in John, he speaks what he hears from the Father. And he testifies about the things of the, that the Son has to say. He points to the words of Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. So the Spirit comes along and says, I'm not here on my, in my own name. I'm not here to point to me. I don't have anything to say but what the Father tells me to say to you. Or I'm going to reinforce what the Son has said that the Father has given him to say. Do you see what's going on here? Not only are these three persons eternally in each other, but they are eternally for each other. They are eternally pointed toward each other. The fundamental orientation of each of the persons is toward the other two. That's God. That's who God is. Three persons who share life, who share love, who defer to one another, who glory for one another, who point to one another. No person is ever for themselves. They are eternally in and pointed towards and for the other. Now I recognize, and I've been worrying about this all week, I recognize, you can take that slide down now, Justin. I recognize that this may seem a little tedious to, to some of you. It may seem a little laborious. What on earth does any of this stuff have to do with my life? And that's a fair question. I mean, I don't know how, how everyone in here came in this morning. I know how a lot of your lives are going. I, I do my best to keep track of, everyone, of everyone's life as much as they want me to, to be a, a part of it, to know what, what you're going through, what your struggles are, the things that, that captivate your heart, the concerns, the fears, the dreams. I want to be a part of your life as much as you'll let me be a part of your life. But I don't know where everyone is today. I mean, some of, you, some of you just rolled out of bed and just 
the clothes just somehow managed to fall on you and you stumbled in here and not even know why you're here. And you're struggling just to even stay awake right now, which I don't blame you for. Some of you just hopped off a tractor. You've worked hard. And your thoughts are on the weather and the crops and what's the, the yield and what this going to happen and that going to happen and what's the government doing. All this stuff is in your mind. And you come in and you hear Pastor Sean talk about all this theology. Others of you are, are struggling through a difficult marriage. You're struggling. You're, you're, you've, you've conjoined yourself to another person and you're having a hard time loving them. You're having a really hard time liking them. And you came in here looking for some hope this morning, for some direction, some, some something. Some of you have lost a job. You're looking for work. You don't know how you're going to make ends meet. You don't, you're struggling with your finances. Others of you have someone who's, that you love that's dying. Some of you are struggling with depression. Some of you have all sorts of physical problems. Some of you are struggling with addictions. And I would venture to say most, if not all of you, are struggling with some type of sin. And so, what does any of this have anything to do with you? Well, I don't have a perfect answer to that, but I can tell you this. Jesus didn't use his final time with his disciples, this last supper and discussion, to give us ten, reason, ten lessons for raising godly children. Jesus didn't give us, in his final moments, five different methods of effective prayer. Jesus didn't give us three financial principles for health, wealth, and happiness. Those things while Jesus could offer all of that, those weren't the things that were most important to his heart. In his final moments on earth, he chose to talk about, he left, no, he left nothing unsaid. The things that needed to be said for their lives and for our lives, Jesus chose to say those things here. Because these things here, these truths about God that are so hard for us to grasp and wrap our minds around, these truths about God are what is, what is most real in all of reality. There's nothing more real, nothing more true than the stuff we're wrestling with this morning. And so, as you come in here with your, your, your own stuff, your own circumstances, the concerns and the issues in your life, I want to tell you that beneath all of those, those things and above all those things and behind and around and in all those things is the Holy One. The Holy One who is holy love. He gives perspective and shape and definition and meaning amidst all of the stuff in life. He is ultimate reality. And, and he is the one in whose image we were created. If you ever want to understand your purpose in life, what it means that you are a person, that you are a human being, that you were born in the family you were born in, and, and have all the, the personality that you have and everything that makes you you, if you ever want to understand what any of that all is all about, you will never get it until you understand this, until you see who God is, because it's in this image that we were created. And sin twists all that around. Sin has deceived us into thinking life is the opposite of everything that we've just talked about. Sin tells you that, that you don't have life in another, you have life within yourself. I have life within me. I don't need, my life isn't found in you. I'm an individual. I have life. I exist in me. I exist for me. <laughs> How many of us came in here thinking that way this morning? Hearts that were created in the image of one who's always turned out towards the other, we come in with hearts that are turned completely the other direction. I exist for me, my way, my will, my desires. You I, I permit you to live with me in order to satisfy my stuff, my needs, my wants, my desires. We may not say that because we know how to put on the good Christian face, but that's what's going on inside our hearts. That's sin. Sin is the very opposite of everything we've said about God. Sin says, I have life in myself, I have life for, my, for myself, and so when you look at the world and you look at all of human history, you can boil all evil and all misery down to this. Hearts that are closed to others and turned in on themselves. That's sin, in a nutshell. My life isn't in you. My life isn't for you. It is mine. It's found in me. It is for me. And Jesus says, listen, that's, 
that's not even true about God. No person of the Trinity says, my life is mine. My, I have life in myself. No, Jesus says, my life is in him. <laughs> no person of the Trinity says, my, my life is for me. No. Each is pointed towards the other. And Jesus says, that's not true about me. That, that is not our intention for you. That is, that's sin. And if you want to understand God, if you want to understand reality, if you want to understand what life is all about, if you even want to understand the salvation that I offer, you have to understand this. John chapter 14, verse 20. Look at it again. Verse 20, it's, it's like a summary statement of everything Jesus is trying to teach them and us. If you have one verse in the Bible that you can say, tell me what it's all about, Pastor Sean. John chapter 14, verse 20. When I am raised to life again, you will know what? That I am in my Father, that you are in me, and that I am in you. And what Jesus does in one verse is he takes all this truth about God, these persons, this this perichoresis of persons who are in and for and toward the other. He says, all that's true about God, I want to make true about you. I want to draw you in to my life, and I want to fill you with my life. <laughs> Everything that's true about me, by nature, I want to make true about you by grace. That's his purpose. That was his purpose from page one. From page one. We've been tracing this theme for weeks all throughout the Old Testament. This God who has delivered a people in an act of grace. He took them to Sinai. He's creating for himself a people among whom he wants to take up residence. He wants to dwell in his people. That phrase you can find over and over and over again is that purpose statement that they would be my people and that I would be their God. God wants to belong to a people. And he wants a people that belong to him. He wants to dwell in them. He wants to belong to them. That sounds an awful lot like marriage to me. Isn't that what you sign up for in marriage? Or at least it's what you're supposed to sign up for. I want to, to dwell in your life. I want your life to dwell in mine. And I want to belong to you. I want to belong to you. This is God's desire from the beginning. This is what it's all about. And the, the covenant that was given was, was how, to, how this works, how this relationship works, how it's lived out, how, these peop, how God and a sinful people can live together and maintain this relationship that has been provided for them by grace. And Jesus comes along and says, all of that, all of that points to me. All of it. All of this discussion about sin and atonement and sacrifice all, and holiness, all of that, Paul calls a tutor. It's preparing a people for Jesus. And Jesus comes and says, I fulfill all of that stuff. All of it. Once and for all. Completely forever in me. And he dies on a cross in this perfect, final, sufficient act of atonement, which was nothing more than a means to an end. You want to know what that end was? To cleanse the temple that could be filled by his presence. That's why, that's why the cross to cleanse for himself a people in whom the Holy Spirit could come dwell. The cross in Pentecost, it's all part of the same plan. I'm going to make myself a home in you so that a holy God could dwell in unholy people. That's his, po it's his whole plan. All that the Old Testament longed to see fulfilled comes into completion right here in John chapter 14, verse 20. In this revelation of Jesus, all that is promised leading up to now is fulfilled in me. God wants to dwell in you, his life in your life. And he will cleanse for himself a temple and make for himself a holy people. And what we've done is we've taken holiness and we've said, no, that is reserved for God alone. That's only God. I'm just a sinner. And God says, well, that's true. I alone am holy, but guess what? I want to manifest my holiness in the world through your life. I want to give you my holiness. And we are a people who no longer have to approach a temple. 
You don't have to go find some building somewhere in the Middle East to find the the presence and glory of God. Jesus says, I'm making you my temple. God dwells in you. God dwells in us. We are the temple of God. He has cleansed us, made us clean by the blood of Jesus so that he could fill us with himself. That's life. That's salvation. That is holiness. The gospel is not just about us having our sins forgiven and spending a blissful eternity in heaven someday after we somehow just manage to stumble through life with our faith reasonably intact. (laughs) Isn't that how we view the Christian life? Well, Jesus forgave me, and I know there's glory ahead, and somehow between this point and that point, I just got to muster up enough strength to make it to the end. That's Now, you chuckle. I heard some chuckles. It is Okay, you chuckle all you want, but that's how many, if not most, if not all of us, are tempted to view the Christian life. Forgiveness here, glory somewhere there, and in between I'm just going to stumble through and just on a wing and a prayer, maybe God will accept me at the end, maybe you won't. Listen, that's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus came to offer you and me, a hope and a prayer, a fool's hope. He came to offer us the life of God in you. Now, in this, in the present, for all of eternity. What Paul says in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not a fool's hope, a sure hope. Those who come to Jesus, confess their sins like we did last week. It's a beautiful morning of confession and repentance. But guess what? That's not the end, that's the beginning. He wants to forgive you and then cleanse you so that he can fill you. That's the gospel. That's why right after chapter 14, what's the next thing Jesus talks about in chapter 15? Jeff knows he preached on it a few weeks ago. What's our relationship to Jesus? Is it lawyer and what would be the legal terminology? The defendant? Is that the sum total of our relationship to Jesus? Is it just a legal? No. Jesus says, in the upper room, (laughs) your connection to me is like a vine and a branch. There is the union and connect, the connectedness that the Father and the Son and the Spirit share, this perichoresis. Jesus says, I want that with you. (laughs) You no longer have to live out of your own resources. You don't have to muster up the goodness or the strength or the holiness. No. No. You connect yourself to the vine. You abide in me. I will abide in you. The same life and love that flows through me flows straight into you. There's no break in between. It's a a continuum because we've been drawn into his life. He makes room in himself for us. And then we come to John chapter 20, verse 22, one of my favorite, favorite verses in all the Bible. Jesus is in this upper room again. It's probably the exact same upper room as in chapter 14, but this is now post cross and post-resurrection. The disciples are up there. They got the doors locked. Jesus shows up, and what does he show them? Do you remember what he showed them? Look. Look at my hands. What's he showing them in his hands? The nail scars, right? This is after he was, this is the glorified body of Jesus. The glorified, perfected, eternal body of the risen Christ still has a scar. In fact, Several scars. Five of them, I would, by my count, two in the wrist, two in the ankles, and one in the side. Jesus says, touch, feel, it's real. (laughs) And in doing so, he's telling them, I have taken into myself your condition. These those scars were not were not his to bear, were they? They were ours. Those are those should have been my nails. Those should have been your nails. Jesus never sinned. You sinned. I sinned. And he bore that on the cross. And he says, into my body, I've taken all of your condition, all of your sinfulness. Paul says, he became sin who knew no sin. But what's the next thing he does in verse 22? It's one of those chuckle passages, if you, if you <laughs> read it on the surface. It says, Jesus went, you can chuckle, Bonnie, it's okay. Yeah. Jesus breathed on them. What's he doing? It's the flip side of the coin. I've taken you into myself, but guess what? I want you to receive all of me. 
I want you to take into yourself my condition. I want you to become a partaker of my nature. Just as I have taken you into me and bear you forever, I want to come into you. I want to fill you with me like a vine connected to a branch. We receive all of who he is. His life courses through ours, and it's inexhaustible. It's, it cannot be measured. It cannot be contained. It's the life of God, the eternal triune creator of the universe, wants to take up residence in you. He says in verse 17 that we read a few minutes ago in chapter 14, talking about the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. He says, you know him because he lives with you now, but guess what? What about later? Look at it. Look in your Bibles. Don't look at me. Look in your Bibles. He will be with you. He's with you now, but later where will he be? In you. In you. All of God in us. So by Jesus, this perfect substitute for you and me who died on a cross in our behalf and in our on, on our behalf and in our place in Christ all of the righteousness of God is imputed unto us. What does that word impute mean? It's, it's a word we don't use very often. It basically means his actions were attributed to us. So God can look at us and say, I see the merit, his merits in you. His merits are attributed to you. His righteousness is imputed to you. But by the Holy Spirit, it's the other half of the gospel. His righteousness is not just imputed, it is imparted. You see the difference? One is something for us. The other is something in us. His righteousness is not just attributed to you and me. His righteousness is transferred to you and to me. It's substitution and transformation. So that Paul can come along and say, you are now dead to sin, but guess what? You're alive to righteousness. What God has done for you and what God has done in you. That is why holiness, that's what holiness is. That's why holiness matters. That's why it's possible in this life. It's perichoresis, the life of God in us. That's holiness. Now contrast that in these final moments this morning with the holiness of the Pharisees. <laughs> the Pharisees' view of holiness is, is similar to, uh, well, quite frankly, a lot of our views. In fact, it defined my view of holiness for many years. And it's one we still, I still struggle with. I'll, I'll just go on a limb and say every day. It's this idea that, that it's some sort of performance. That it's, it's me achieving some standard through my own self-discipline and devotion. If I just do this enough, if I just work this hard, if I just try this, this thing, if I g give up that thing, then somehow I can muster up through my performance holiness. That's what, that's, I think that's a very pharisaical view of holiness. John says in, back in chapter 12, verse 43, that the Pharisees loved human praise more than the praise of God. <laughs> they cared more about what others thought about their religiosity and their holiness than what God thought about it. Because to a Pharisee, holiness is an it. It's something to be weighed and measured and evaluated and judged. It's restricted to the external, the outward behavior. It has nothing to do with the heart, nothing to do with motive or attitude, the things from the inside. The Pharisees' holiness did not presuppose faith. It didn't presuppose tr trust or surrender. It was all about effort and rigor and commitment. And as a church that... Can, can trace its, its heritage back to the very heart of the holiness tradition. We have to be aware of the fact that the holiness tradition has gotten holiness wrong time and time again, just like this. That holiness is all about making ourselves acceptable to God, impressing other people with, with just how good a Christian we are, making other people feel bad for not measuring up to the standards that we have set for them. We've reduced holiness to a list of do's and don'ts. If you do these things and don't do these things, you're holy. And Jesus says, no, that's not holiness. In fact, what that is, is death to you and others. That is death. It's not life. It's not the life of God. 
That's the death of men. And William Temple comes along and says, if your theology of God is wrong, the more religious you become, the more dangerous you become. That's why the Pharisees were dangerous, (laughs) because they were really religious with bad theology. That's why I'm willing to sacrifice perhaps your attention and maybe your respect to go through a bunch of theology on a screen with a bad graphic, because your theology matters. Your view of God matters because your view of God is going to shape your perception of everything else. It's going, to help you, it's going to make you understand what creation is about, what history is about, what salvation is about, what it even is. If you start with the wrong beginning point, you're going to end in the wrong end point. And that's where holiness has gotten wrong. We've missed something somewhere and we've reduced holiness to something that we can quantify and calculate and judge others on. And Jesus says, no, no. Holiness is something beautiful. It's something freeing. It's something life-giving. It's not do's and don'ts. No, holiness is a byproduct of a relationship. It's the life of Jesus in us by his Spirit. It's understanding and experiencing all of life, all of salvation, even being itself as communion. It's when, by faith, we look to Jesus as our life. He is our life. Life is not in me, it's in him. Paul calls him, our, in Colossians, our, he is our real life. It's when in submission we allow his spirit to come into our hearts and occupy the throne at the center of who we are so that he can turn our hearts outward and say, I don't only find my life in another, I find my life for another. I live all of life for another. He has changed my mind, my perspective, my whole orientation. It's no longer curved in, it's curved out. Byproduct of a relationship. It's not a performance. It's a passion. It's not what we do for God. It's the result of God in us. It's not a contest to see who can do it best. That's where holier than thou came from, right? You think you're holier than I am. You think you're doing more. You're better. You're you're more of a Christian than I am. That's not holiness. Holiness is the glow on the face of those who know they are loved unconditionally. (laughs) It's the radiation of a life in communion with the life-giving one. It's not about making ourselves acceptable to God. It's discovering ourselves acceptable to God. (laughs) The one whose face is always turned towards us in love. The one who loves and comes to us and takes us as we are that he might change us into what he is. Holiness is responding in loving trust and obedience to the one who gave his life away for you and for me. Whose desire is for us to look him in the face and never again turn ours away in shame. That's holiness. It's life. It's salvation. And I know this sermon doesn't fix anyone's problems in here. I get it. The crops need to be planted. The job search continues. The loved one is still dying. The marriage is still on the ropes. You still have that depression. You struggle with your finances. The kids are driving you crazy. (laughs) Fill in the blank. I get it. Life is full of stuff. But guess what? This is what life is all about. This will give purpose and meaning and direction to everything else. This is real, lasting, abiding life. God in you, you in him, vine to a branch. So that no matter your circumstances, no matter how difficult things are, your relationships or your struggles, you can look to the one who looked you, who looks at you and gave himself away for you to the point of death, even death on a cross. You can look to him face to face. And see, he not only loves me, he desires to penetrate, to permeate all of my life with his. He is able and willing to saturate every second of your day with his holy love, giving you meaning and purpose and power for all of life and godliness. I am not in the least interested in the what of holiness. 
I'll leave that to the Pharisees. I'll leave that to the Pharisees. I am concerned with the who. I want to know the, the Holy One. I want to know the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Three persons in the other, for the other, who, inv- who are inviting you and me into that reality so that all of our lives can be lived in another, for another. That's holiness. Life in another, life for another. And that's what his Holy Spirit does. That's what he does. And Jesus says in verse 17, don't miss it. He says, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, because it isn't looking for him. (laughs) Who are you looking for this morning? Who are you looking for? If you're looking for him, by faith, the promise is in verse 23. My father will love you. He will come and make his home in you. Are you looking for him today? That's my challenge to you this morning. As Jeff comes to close us in song, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to worship. The altar's open if you want to come. There's no expectation or requirement to come. You come if you feel led, but you're also welcome to just stay where you are and let us, let's turn our faces towards the one whose face is turned towards us, shall we? Let's pray. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are so much bigger than anything we can conceive of. You're so much higher. You're so much wider. You're so much deeper. You are mysterious, and yet you make yourself known. Your desire is not for us to exhaustively comprehend you. Your desire is for us to comprehensively love you, (laughs) to know you, to follow you. Lord, that is our heart's desire. And many of us in here are struggling with all sorts of stuff today, and you know about it all, and you care about it all. And my prayer for these precious people this morning is that no matter what they're going through, no matter what they're facing, they would face that with the Holy One who is with them, but also in them. Lord, turn our hearts out. Help us to find our life, our salvation, our meaning, our purpose, everything, that our identity in you and in you alone. Lord, we trust that you're doing that this morning and that you'll continue to do it as we go. Lord, we pray that you would inhabit our praise. Fill this place with your presence and make us more like you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.